In this video, I'd like to talk about a topic I wish I had learned while I was in school, but was never taught. It's a method of modeling a data set using a technique called linear least squares, and now that I know it, I use it all the time. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time reviewing the least squares method, but even if you're already familiar with this technique, I'm hoping to still surprise you by expanding the concept to solve problems that aren't typically addressed when least squares is explained. While making this video, I also found that just watching data get fit is extremely satisfying. Suppose we have a discrete data set that we want to represent as a continuous function. So we look at the data and think, hmm, this looks like it's trending upwards somewhat linearly. Let's find the line that best represents this data. But how do we do that? We know that a line can be expressed in the form y equals mx plus b but how would we find the values of m and b that best represent our data set? For that matter, what does it even mean to best represent a data set? As a quick aside, I want to point out that the fact that we're fitting a line versus some other type of function is not what we mean by linear least squares. In fact, I'm hoping to show how broad the linear least squares technique actually is, but more on that later. Back to our data set. Let's start by defining the vertical distance between a data point and the line. We'll call this the point's error. If a point is close to the line, its error is small, and if it's far from the line, its error is large. So we can write the error for the first data point as the difference between the point and the line's y values. If we want to define how close the line is to the entire data set, we must account for the error of each individual data point. So we'll include the error for point 2, point 3, and so on. Now we have an expression for the total error, and we want to make this error as small as possible. So we'll find the minimum of the error function by setting its first derivatives to zero and solving for m and b. Since we're minimizing, this is where the term least comes in in linear least squares. Rather than dealing with the absolute values which have discontinuous derivatives, we can redefine the error function to use the error squared. I love how subtly clever this is. By redefining the error, we can simplify the problem without altering the solution. This is due to the nature of the squaring function, which has the same minimum as the absolute value function, but with a continuous derivative. Therefore, if we minimize the square of the error, then we have also minimized the error itself. So this is what we mean by linear least squares, because we're actually minimizing the sum of the squared error terms. To illustrate this, suppose you have a group of numbers, as well as a second group, which is the square of the first group. Now, if you ask one person to find the minimum of the first group, and another person to find the minimum of the second group, they will both come up with the same location. And the beauty of this is now we don't have to deal with any discontinuities or piecewise functions while we're taking derivatives during the minimization process. At this point, we can minimize the error squared by taking derivatives with respect to m and b. To take the derivative with respect to m, we can bring the derivative operator inside the summation. Then we'll bring down the power of 2 and multiply by the coefficient of the m term, which is negative x sub n. To take the derivative with respect to b, it's almost the exact same thing, except that the coefficient of the b term is just negative 1. After setting these derivatives equal to 0, we have two equations with two unknowns. Furthermore, the equations are linear in the coefficients m and b. This is actually what we mean by linear least squares. The curve we're fitting in this example happens to be a line, but that's just for simplicity of this explanation, and it need not be the case in order for the technique to apply in general. So far, this has been our fitting function. In this notation, the semicolon separates the independent variable from the unknown parameters. Now instead of a line, let's further generalize the fitting function. Unfortunately, we cannot use any old thing we want, but we can use it on a broad class of functions. The constraint is that we must be able to separate the unknown parameters from the data points, such that the fitting function can be expressed as a linear combination of a set of basis functions. So let's tuck this away and talk about our basis functions. Basis functions can be closed form, as in the polynomial example, recursive, like the Chebyshev relationship, or you could just have a discrete set of functions that you wish to combine. In the displayed example, the fitting function would just be c0 times x plus c1 times sine x. The reason we define the fitting function in this way is because its first derivatives are easy to define, which is important for minimization. 
we find that the derivative with respect to the ith parameter is equal to the ith basis function. The fact that the summation completely disappears, leaving just one simple term behind, boggles my mind and really emphasizes the beauty of this technique. The reason is that the derivative is with respect to c sub i, so the phi term pops outside the derivative and you're left with differentiating c sub n with respect to c sub i. So all the summation terms are constants with respect to c sub i, so their derivatives are zero, except for one term when n equals i, such that c sub n equals c sub i, in which case its derivative is one. Now we know what types of functions we can use for linear least squares, so if it's all right with you, I'd like to go just a little bit deeper to find a convenient way to solve for our unknown parameters. The next part gets a little involved notationally, but I don't want you to miss the essence. So I'm going to do a side-by-side -side with the line case to give you something to hold on to. For a single data point, we have a relationship between its x and y values. We can also list this relationship for an entire data set. I've switched to approximations because any given data point does not lie directly on the fit line, rather somewhere near it. We can write this in matrix form, which gives us access to our arsenal of linear algebra techniques. Now let's see that again, but with our generic fitting function. Okay, this looks a bit rough, but really it's the same thing as on the left side of the screen. The important thing is that we have our unknown c parameters separated from our basis phi functions. It looks cleaner in matrix form. There are n rows because there are n points in the data set, and there are m plus 1 columns because the coefficient index starts at 0. For example, a line is of order 1, so it has 1 plus 1 is 2 parameters to be solved. I'll refer to the matrix as x because it depends entirely of known x values from the data set and nothing else. If you ever end up with unknowns in the x matrix, you'll know something has gone awry. So we'll rewrite this compactly as xc is approximately y. Once again, we'll define the error as the difference between the data y values and the fit y values. I'm going to blaze through this matrix derivation because I have more exciting things to show afterwards, and this part isn't really the focus of the video, but I'll include it here so you can have it as a reference. We still want the error squared, so we'll multiply both sides by the transpose of the error vector. Now substitute the definition of error on the right-hand side, and on the left-hand side, a row vector times a column vector gives the magnitude squared. Now distribute the transpose through the parentheses, paying special attention to the order of matrix products. And finally, expand the expression to remove the parentheses, and there you have it. This is our error squared function that we wish to minimize. It looks ugly in this form, but it's really just a quadratic with respect to the c parameters. So we'll set its derivative with respect to c equal to zero. Here we have a constant term because it contains no c's. And here are two linear terms that each contain one c. And here's a quadratic term because there are two c's multiplied together. And we already know how to differentiate a quadratic. Here we have a, a general quadratic, which I wrote with two linear terms just for comparison purposes. And here's its derivative. Similarly, the derivative of the matrix expression is this. Now, as it turns out, the two linear terms are actually equal, so they add and give a 2, which conveniently cancels with the 2 from the derivative of the quadratic term. So now we're almost done. We just need to solve this equation for c. Currently, c is pre-multiplied by the matrix product x transpose times x. Now, thankfully, this matrix is square and typically has an inverse in curve-fitting applications. So we need to multiply on the left side by x transpose x inverse, which will solve for c. If you're ever looking this stuff up, this handy matrix product is called the left pseudo inverse. It's a good one to have in your back pocket. And now we come to the fun part. Suppose the data set that we want to fit looks a bit Gaussian in nature, which looks something like this. The Gaussian normal distribution has this lovely exponential form, which is clearly nonlinear. And what's even worse is that it's not a linear combination of basis functions, which was our criteria for being able to use the linear least squares technique. But maybe we're not stuck just yet. Usually when I see a variable in an exponent, I try to use a logarithm as a ladder so I can bring them off their shelf. So let's take the natural log of both sides, and a few simplifications.
and we've successfully separated our parameters from the data. This big term is C0. Here's C1 multiplied by x, and here's C2 which is multiplied by x squared. So we can write this in matrix form like this. Here we have x, c, and y, which we already have a solution for. All that remains is to use the c parameters to find the intended a, mu, and sigma parameters, which I'll leave for you to solve. Outside the scope of this video, all we need to know for this example is that it has a property called capacitance that depends on an externally applied voltage. So if I wanted to use this particular diode in a circuit simulation, I would need to model its capacitance as a function of voltage, so the circuit simulator would actually have something to solve. The datasheet gives a plot of capacitance versus voltage, which we'll use as our dataset to be fit. The diode's capacitance will have the following form as a function of voltage. Here, V is the externally applied voltage, which is the independent variable. VB is a known constant called the barrier potential, so it's something that we don't have to solve for. Cj and gamma are the unknown parameters that we wish to find suitable values for. Once again, this doesn't look like a linear combination of functions, so we'll have to do some more manipulation. And just like last time, I've chosen an example where we have a variable, this time gamma, in an exponent. So we'll try taking the log of both sides. Now we'll rewrite this as a difference of two logarithms. And finally, we can bring down the power of gamma. So now we've successfully separated our parameters from the independent variable v. So now we can rewrite this in matrix form, and we know how to solve for our unknowns using the left pseudo inverse. In this case, the solved coefficient vector gives the natural log of cj to be 5.18 and negative gamma to be negative 1.69. Therefore, cj is 177.42 and gamma is 1.69. And here is the resulting fit plotted alongside the data. There's something incredibly satisfying about seeing the curve actually fall near the data, so I encourage you to try this out for yourself sometime. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this topic and are able to find a use for it someday. Stay tuned for more videos to come. I'll see you next time.